I'm Miss Mary Beth. I'm the Youth Services Librarian at Ingalls Memorial Library in Minge, and I'm here today for Armchair Adventures. And that's where I read a book to you. And right now we're working on the book Voyages of Dr. Doolittle. And this was written by Hugh Lofting. And maybe you've seen the movie, maybe you've heard about it. Do you know who Dr. Doolittle is? He's pretty cool. He's the vet, so he's a veterinarian who works on animals, but he can talk to the animals. I wish I could do that. That's pretty cool. And this is all about his story. And right now, our story is told by a narrator who's a nine-year-old boy named Tommy Stubbins. And he meets Dr. Doolittle for the first time, and he's so excited, and he really loves animals, and he's just learning all about Dr. Doolittle and how cool he is. And he's meeting all of his animals. He has a lot of animals in his house. And we left off, and we're starting on chapter 10, which starts at, the, which is called The Private Zoo. I did not think that there could be anything left in that garden which we had not seen. But the doctor took me by the arm and started off down a little narrow path. And after many windings and twistings and turnings, we found ourselves before a small door in the high stone wall. The doctor pushed it open. Inside still was another garden. I had expected to find cages with animals inside them, but there were none to be seen. Instead, there were little stone houses here and there all over the garden, and each house had a window and a door. As we walked in, many of these doors opened, and animals came running out to us, evidently expecting food. Haven't the doors any locks on them? I asked the doctor. Oh, yes, he said. Every door has a lock. But in my do the door, zoo, the door is open from the inside, not from the out. The locks are only there so the animals can go and shut themselves in any time they want to get away from the annoyance of the other animals or from people who might come here. Every animal in the zoo stays here because he likes it, not because he's made to. They all look very happy and clean, I said. Would you mind telling me the names of some of them? Certainly. Well, now, that funny-looking thing with plates on his back, nosing under the brick over there, is a South American armadillo. The little chap talking to him is a Canadian woodchuck. They both live in those holes you see at the foot of the wall. The two little beets doing antics in the pond are a pair of Russian minks. And that reminds me, I must go and get them some herrings from the town before, before noon. It is early closing today. That animal just stepping out of his house is an antelope, one of the smaller South African kinds. Now, let us move to the other side of those bushes there, and I will show you some more. Are those deer over there? I asked. Deer? said the doctor. Where do you mean? Over there, I said, pointing, nibbling that grass border of the bed. There are two of them. Oh, that, said the doctor with a smile. That isn't two animals. That's one animal with two heads. The only two-headed animal in the world. It's called the Push Me Pull You. I brought him back from Africa. He's very tame. He acts as kind of a night watchman for my zoo. He only sleeps with one head at a time, you see. Very handy. The other head stays awake all night. Do you think that's a real animal? Have you any lions or tigers? I asked as we moved along. No, said the doctor. It wouldn't be possible to keep them here, and I wouldn't keep them even if I could. If I had my way, Stubbins, there wouldn't be a single lion or tiger in captivity anywhere in the world. They never take to it. They're never happy. They never settle down. They're always thinking of the big countries they have left behind. You can see it in their eyes. Dreaming. Dreaming always of the great open spaces where they were born. Dreaming of the deep, dark jungles where their mothers first taught them how to scent and track deer. And what are they given in exchange for all this? Asked the doctor, stopping in his walk and growing all red and angry. What are they given in exchange for the glory of the African sunrise, for the twilight breeze whispering through the palms, for the green shade of the matted, tangled vines, for the cool, big starred nights of the desert, for the patter of the waterfall after a hard day's hunt? What, I ask you, are they given in exchange for these? Why, a bear cage with iron bars, an ugly piece of dead meat thrust into them once a day, and a crowd of fools to come and stare at them with open mouths. <gasps> no, Stubbins, lions and tigers, the big hunters, should never, never be seen in zoos. The doctor seemed to have grown terribly serious, almost sad. But suddenly his manner changed again, and he took me by the arm with his same old cheerful smile. But we haven't seen the butterfly houses yet, nor the aquariums. Come along. I'm very proud of my butterfly houses. Off we went again, and we came presently into a hedged in un enclosure. Here I saw several big huts made of fine wire netting, like cages. Inside the netting, all sorts of beautiful flowers were growing in the sun, with butterflies skimming over them. 
The doctor pointed to the end of one of the huts where little boxes with holes in them stood in a row. Those are hatching boxes, said he. There I put the different kinds of caterpillars. And as soon as they turn into butterflies and moss, they come out into these flower gardens to feed. Do butterflies have a language? I asked. Oh, I fancy they have, said the doctor. And the beetles too. But so far I haven't succeeded in learning much about insect languages. I have been too busy lately trying to master the shellfish talk. I mean to take it up, though. At that moment, Polynesia joined us and said, Doctor, there are two guinea pigs at the back door. They say they have run away from the boy who kept them because he didn't, they didn't get the right stuff to eat. They want to know if you will take them in. All right, said the doctor. Show them the way to the zoo. Give them the house on the left near the gate, the one the black fox had. Tell them what the rules are and give them a square meal. Now, Stubbins, we will go on to the aquariums. And first of all, I must show you my big glass seawater tank where I keep the shellfish. And that is the end of chapter 10. Quite a zoo he has, right? He has very passionate ideas about zoos. Chapter 11 is called My Schoolmaster Polynesia. Well, there were not many days after that, you may be sure, when I did not come to see my new friend. Indeed, I was at his house practically all day and every day. So that one evening my mother asked me jokingly why I did not take my bed over there and live at the doctor's house altogether. After a while, I think I got to be quite useful to the doctor, feeding his pets for him, helping to make new houses and fences for the zoo, assisting with the sick animals that came, doing all manner of odd jobs about the place. So that although I enjoyed it very much, it was indeed like living in a new world, I really think that the doctor would have missed me if I had not come so often. And all this time, Polynesia came with me wherever I went, teaching me bird language and showing me how to understand the talking signs of the animals. At first I thought I should never be able to learn it all. It seemed so difficult. But the old parrot was wonderfully patient with me, though I could see that occasionally she had hard work to keep her temper. Soon I began to pick up the strange chatter of the birds and to understand the funny talking antics of the dogs. I used to practice listening to the mice behind the wainscot after I went to bed and watching the cats on the roof and pigeons in the market square of Puddleby. And the days passed very quickly, as they always do when life is pleasant, and the days turned into weeks and weeks into months, and soon the roses in the doctor's garden were losing their petals, and yellow leaves lay upon the wide green lawn, for the summer was nearly gone. One day Polynesia and I were talking in the library. This was a fine long room with a grand mantelpiece, and the walls were covered from ceiling to floor with shelves of books. Books of stories, books on gardening, books about medicine, books of travel. These I loved, especially the doctor's great atlas with its maps of all the different countries of the world. This afternoon, Polynesia was showing me the books about animals, which Don Doolittle had written himself. My, I said, what a lot of books the doctor has. All the way around the room. Goodness, I wish I could read. It must be tremendously interesting. Can you read, Polynesia? Only a little, she said. Be careful how you turn those pages. Don't tear them. No, I really don't get enough time for reading. Much. The letter there is a K, and this is a B. What does this word under the picture mean, I asked. Let me see, she said, and she started spelling it out. B-A-B-O-O-N. That's monkey. Reading isn't nearly as hard as it looks once you know the letters. She's close, wasn't she? A baboon is a type of monkey. Maybe it's an ape. Polynesia, I said, I want to ask you something very important. What is it, my boy? She said, smoothing down the feathers of her right wing. Polynesia often spoke to me in a very patronizing way, but I did not mind it from her. After all, she was nearly 200 years old, and I had only just turned 10. Listen, I said, my mother doesn't think it's right that I come here for so many meals, and I was going to ask you, supposing I did a whole lot more work for the doctor, why couldn't I come and live here altogether? You see, instead of being paid like a regular gardener or workman, I could get my bed and meals in exchange for the work I did. What do you think? You mean you want to be a proper assistant to the doctor? Is that it? Yes, I suppose that what's you, that's what you call it, I answered. You said yourself that you thought I could be very useful to him. Well, just thought a moment. I really don't see why not, but is this what you want to be when you grow up? A naturalist? Yes, I said. I've made up my mind. I would soon be a na sooner be a naturalist than anything else in the world. Humph. Let's go and speak to the doctor about it, said Polynesia. He's in the next room, in the study. Open the door very gently, 
He may be working and may not want to be disturbed. I opened the door quietly and I peeped in. The first thing I saw was an enormous black retriever dog sitting in the middle of the hearth rug with his ears cocked up, listening to the doctor, who was reading aloud to him from a letter. What's the doctor doing? I asked Polynesia in a whisper. Oh, the dog has had a letter from his mistress and he has brought it to the doctor to read for him. That's all. He belongs to a funny little girl called Minnie Dooley, who lives on the other side of town. She has pigtails down her back. She and her brother have gone away to the seaside for the summer, and the old retriever is heartbroken while the children are gone. So they write letters to him. In English, of course. And as the old dog doesn't understand them, he brings them here, and the doctor turns them into don dog language for him. I think Minnie must have written that she is coming back, to judge from the dog's excitement. Just look at him carrying on. Indeed, the retriever seemed to be suddenly overcome with joy. As the doctor finished the letter, the old dog started jumping at the top of his voice, started barking at the top of his voice, wagging his tail wildly and jumping up about the study. He took the letter in his mouth and he ran out of the room, snorting hard and mumbling to himself. He's going down to meet the coach, said Polynesia. The dog's devotion to these children is more than I can understand. You should see Minnie. She's the most conceited thing that ever walked. She squints, too. That was the end of chapter 11. So we'll stop there for today. And tomorrow we'll listen to what, ha what the doctor says when Tommy tells him his great idea. So thanks for reading with me today. And this armchair adventure is part of our summer reading program. So if you're listening, if you have a Read Squared account online, did you ever read Squared account? Have you gone to ingleslibrary.com to the children's and teens page to see all the information to make your own Read Squared account? If you haven't, you should. Create your own account and then log in the code word for today's armchair adventure. And the code word for today is Polynesia. Got it? Okay. Log it, log it in. Thanks for joining me. Have a fun day.